you know, I, I, uh, I get to live down the hall from this guy and um, it is such a joy to be able to live and do ministry together. Uh, his wife and my wife uh, serving in our church, leading our church, and we're so thankful. One of the things that I have often uh, shared about Stephen is I've known, Stephen and I have known each other, of each other for a distance for a long time. And I always just, you know, loved his spirit, loved the way he helped me get closer to the Lord. But what I didn't know was he is a terrific theologian and a great leader of people. He's a great discipler of people. I didn't know that. And the other thing is, is he is, here's how I would describe it. He's like a catcher's mitt. Because I'll be working on these sermon series and we work way in advance and I'll come flying down the hallway. You got a minute? <laughs> he always be like this. Come on. So I'll come into his office, sit down, shoot. And then I'll share everything that I'm thinking and processing. He'll help me process it. Because at the end of the day, what we want is we want our church to be more like Christ. Uh, that's what we all want, right? And it's just great to have a partner uh, in that who really genuinely loves that. And he and I are surrounded by people like that. We are surrounded by great people like that. So let's go ahead and uh, begin our day today. So this was a three-day class, The Tale of a Dove, Shocking Untold Stories. Uh, the first day, we talked about uninformed, what we weren't told about the Spirit. Second day, uniformed, what we were told we had to believe about the Spirit, right or wrong. And then today, pneumoformed, uh, breathing a spirit life into the body. And I know you know this, but sometimes a little reminder helps, right? Uh, pneuma, uh, Greek word for air, right? Or wind or breath or what else? Spirit, right. So a spirit formed church. Dallas Willard gives this outstanding definition of spirit. He said, you have to understand, spirit is unbodily personal power. So I, I thought about this. I should have said this the very first day. But like, for instance, we wouldn't talk about the Hoover Dam as having a spirit, but we would talk about it producing power. Right. So power and spirit overlap, but they're not the same thing. Right. And so we often will like we read Ecclesiastes at a funeral, you know, that the body goes back to the ground from which it came, but the spirit goes to God. So we know that there's more to us. Jesus said, love the Lord your God. And he gave these kind of these four uh, overlapping quadrants of life that create the, that make up the human right body, soul, mind and spirit. So we recognize that spirit un bodily personal power is who God is. OK. We talked about this theology, spirit theology, that is critical uh, in our understanding of what's going on in the New Testament, that people meet God, they experience God, and then they live the entirety of their life out of two questions. Who is the God I met and what does he want for my life? Uh, another, remember we looked at this in the life of Paul, remember on the Damascus Road, he meets the Lord. What's Paul's first question? Who are you? Right. And then the Lord tells him the answer to the second question. You need to go into town because someone else is going to tell you what to do. Right. Well, I thought about this. You remember in Matthew chapter 16 when Jesus kind of does a mid ministry checkup and he says to his disciples, who do these people think I am? And they kind of run through a list of options. And he says, all right. All right. Well, OK, I can see other things. But who do you who do you say that I am? Because if you don't get the identity question right, we're in trouble. Right. So this is about knowing God and knowing what he wants from our life. Uniform doctrine that we looked at yesterday. We looked at a set of these uh, that we were taught. Miracles ended uh, when the Bible was completed. That is absolutely nowhere in Scripture. So one of the things we got to remember is this. If that's your interpretation of Scripture, OK, but hold it lightly. Don't be arguing with someone over it and don't be trying to convince people that it's biblical. Say something like, I like mayo on my hamburger. I don't like onions. And I think that first Corinthians 13 has something to do with when the Bible canon was finished. Because that's what we are working with. 
You all realize that some people think it means the second coming of Christ, right? You all know this, right? And they'll hammer away at the people who think it's the canon as if either one of them knows who should have mayo or ketchup. This is why the body of Christ gets in trouble is because we hold these things too tightly that aren't actually said in Scripture. So if you, are you hearing me? If you think this is what it means, good. Okay. But that's not what it means. It's just what you think it means. And boy, isn't there a world of difference in all of that? Now, I'll tell you how big of a difference is. You tell your wife that setting the temperature a little cooler will feel better. <laughs> and she might tell you something else. And the happiness of your marriage might hang in the balance. You see, at my church, I am not going to tell anyone that the Bible says that miracles ended when the Bible was completed because we've been trying to help them study the Bible with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. If they study it and find out it's not in there, they're going to wonder what else we're telling them that isn't in there. So you can just say, you know, I've been thinking about this and this is kind of what I think and leave it at that. Keep it light. Hold it loosely because the Bible does not say this. Okay. Holy Spirit doesn't dwell in us except through the word. We took a lot of time on that one yesterday, didn't we? We read a ton of scripture, so we can't go through them all again. Uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not for everyone, but only for those who live during the times of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 kind of ends that uh, uh, falsity. Uh, Holy Spirit only communicates through the word. And remember, we all read all these scriptures together yesterday, so that helped us out. Uh, people only received the Holy Spirit when they were baptized. This one was a tougher one. How many of you met this one was a little tougher? How many had some conversations afterward when you got out of here and kind of started working on this one? This one's a little squirrely. But here's something I want you to think about. I've got some questions that I think will be helpful, and we'll just work through these as we introduce today. Number one, is the Spirit bound by our systematic pneumatology? Another way of saying that, must God make sense? You see, that's the trouble, isn't it? Because if God was going to make sense in human wisdom, then you realize he would have to give up who he is and chase us to figure out what our thought of the day is. So this is why it says in the Old Testament, hey, my thoughts are not your thoughts. I mean, a man, as high as the heavens are above the earth, that's how high my thoughts are above yours. First Corinthians chapter two, he said, you understand, we do speak a wisdom, but it's not the wisdom of this world. The people that think like that killed Jesus. Oh, yeah, that's the point. Right. He says, man, you guys got to understand, we're not after the mind of the world, we're after the mind of Christ. We're not trying to get God to kind of somehow shimmy himself down into the postmodern skinny jeans of our logic. <laughs> God is going to say, listen, I am God. I will do as I will. And you just need to stay up with me. Don't try to get me to slow down. Don't put a resistor to impede my power. If I did things one way one time and I did things one way another time, then go tell people that. Don't try to get me to act one way because you're photoshopping deity. trying to make me look like I do the same thing every single time, even when in scripture, I don't do the same thing every single time. So stop telling people that. You say, well, the Bible says that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he says, I am absolutely as unpredictable today as I've ever been. <laughs> you're right. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Because I, I know who's gathered in I've been coming to this class, you understand, for over 20 years. When other people have been teaching in here, a lot of us kind of migrate here, right? So I've heard these over the years. Like, for instance, if you think God does the exact same thing every time, why does King Saul get the boot and King David gets the crown? If he does the same thing every time. Because it would look like David blew it worse. He knocked out five of the Ten Commandments in one shot. 
How many have ever thought about even like Uzzah and David? And you're just like, I, I don't know what to do, right? I love it when people talk about a traditional family and we kind of get hung up on what a traditional family is and they mix it over with a biblical traditional family. And I, have you ever thought about how hard it is to find a biblical traditional family in the Bible? It's really something, isn't it? Jesus says, well, uh, you know, if you look back at Adam and Eve before anything went wrong, this is what God was looking for. And then if, have you ever thought about if Abraham, Sarah and Hagar and their boys tried to place membership at your church? <laughs> or think about this one. Think about Judah and Tamar. They show up and you're like, huh, you know, probably a second marriage for him. He's an older guy, right? Hey, well, welcome. We're so glad. Oh, they have twins. You know, let's, let's take them to the children's ministry, you know. And they got these two little boys and they're so cute. And hey, let's take them to lunch afterward, you know. So they go to lunch. They say, you're Judah, right? Yeah, you're Tamar. Yeah. How long have you known each other? <laughs> That's, uh, and I can see Tamar. Go ahead, Judah. <laughs> right? Right? Have you thought about this? Okay, so after the two, after you guys have lunch and you pay, and of course you realize Tamar still carries his ID and you pay and you're walking out and you get in your car and you look over at your wife and she looks back at you and you say, I'm resigning as an elder. <laughs> Honey, I was trying to listen. The restaurant was noisy. She was married to his, his oldest boy, then the next one, but the last one, which we taught our junior high boys had something to do with masturbation, but didn't get married, right? And then, you guys don't know that story? <laughs> and then, and then she, did she look like a prostitute? Was he When are we going to just let it be that God does what God wants to do? And if God wants the Holy Spirit to come on some folk before they're baptized so that someone that doesn't think they ought to be baptized would go ahead and baptize them, that's God's business. And you're like, well, no, he can't do that. Yes, he can because he already did it. <laughs> you can't say you can't do that. God's going to say, but I already did I know, but you shouldn't have. Who are you telling you shouldn't have, Peter? You're telling God. So let's just say today, God, uh, it's, it's tough on me, but I'm good with it. You, you keep messing up doctrine. God says, well, you know, bear in mind, bear in mind, what you call doctrine might need to be, need to be just, you know, expanded a little bit to include me. Okay. So now, do we know all the ways the Spirit works on our behalf? I agree with you for many reasons. Here's one. Think about what you know about the Spirit now that you didn't even know 15 years ago, right? You see, this is one of the things I loved about Thomas Campbell, Alexander Campbell's dad. He made the point that just as there are always old men, uh, young men and children in the kingdom of God, you know, quoting that first John chapter two illustration, he said, no one will ever know everything that's going on. No one's never going to know all the word word. And at the end of the day, people have different educational opportunities. One thing goes one way. One goes, uh, Thomas Campbell said that should never divide the body of Christ. So the fact that someone doesn't know everything the spirit's doing, that would be all of us at some point along the continuum. And here's something I think is important. Is there any theological benefit to the, uh, for the church derived from the Spirit working in a variety of ways? Of course, I think the answer is yes. Because the fact that the Spirit works differently in you in some ways than he does in me opens me up to more of the Spirit. So it's actually good that he's doing different things in different people. A solemn reminder, please hear this carefully. 
It is absolutely impossible for any of us now, later, ever to fully explore the being and ministry of the Holy Spirit. He's God. He cannot be restricted to the interpretation of our denominational boxes. Now, we all know that up here, right? It's a little harder in class when people are asking you questions and we're trying to give them faithful answers. But we do know this is true, correct? We do know this is true. So let's step into this today. The pneumoformed life. I'm excited about this. Let's dive right in. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that, the, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So what I want you to do, if you're taking notes or just kind of remembering this in your mind, I want you to think that the last session we're doing today is about the interior work of the Holy Spirit. The interior work of the Holy Spirit. And I think this is the greatest work of all. The interior work of the Holy Spirit. See if you know this passage. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, will believe also in me, says Jesus. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come back. And take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. And you know the place I'm going. And the first of three of his disciples steps into this dinner conversation at the Last Supper. So Thomas is the first to open a conversation. Lord, we don't know where you're going. So, I mean, how could we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now this is vital because what he's saying is you're still imagining that you could enter this on your way zap <laughs> from to go. Jesus said, I am the way zap. So you'll just have to follow me around. And wherever I am is exactly where you ought to be in that moment. If you're with me, you're where you ought to be. Huh. All right. If you really knew me, you would know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. So we get the second one. Philip said, well, Lord, show us the father and that'll be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? So what's Jesus saying now? Well, you wanted to put your soul on this end of ways app. You want to put God on the other end and hit go. You understand that if you got to me, you got to him. So if you're with me, you're with him. Don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I say to you, do not, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it's the Father living in me who's doing his work. Believe me when I say I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the work that I've been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me, any, ask me for anything in my name. I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. Who is it? The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. Why? Well, for he lives with you, everyone out loud together. And will be in you. Now, you all know this is coming right off of 
of John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39, on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stands up and with a loud voice, right, he cries out, let anyone come to me who's thirsty and I'll give them living water, right? And from within them will rivers of water will flow. And what does John say? Oh, and by the way, he was talking about the spirit whom they had not yet received. Why? Because he was going to be given in a unique way after Jesus was glorified. So Jesus picks that up again. He lives with you. He will live in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you before long. The world will not see me anymore, but you will. Because I live, you also will live. So on that day, you'll realize that I am in the Father and you're in me and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my father. And I too will uh, love them and show myself to them. Well, then Judas, not the betrayer, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Well, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them. We'll come to them, make our home with them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. And all this I've spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. We are ranked as the most anxious nation in the world. Many of you know this. Longitudinal studies that have been done for over 30 years. We consistently come out as the most rank, uh, ranked as the most anxious nation of the world. Here, let me put this in perspective. In second behind us is Colombia, South, uh, South America. How many of you are familiar with Colombia? Their politics, everything is going on there. They're less anxious than us. You want me to put it in one more quick perspective? In Nigeria, they are five times less anxious than we are. Nigeria, have you watched the news over the last 10 years? We are the most anxious nation in the world. The millennials are the most anxious generation, but I want to talk to you about this. If you go look, look online and you look at this longitudinal studies that have been done, it's been climbing for the last 60 years. Each generation more anxious than the last. William James, some of you will remember, this tremendous author, theologian, sociologist, said he called our national anxiousness Americanitis. Now watch this. Andrea Tone in her book, The Age of Anxiety, writes that our anxiousness in America is regarded as a badge of honor, quoting, it's the price we pay for our stunning success. If you're going to be as successful as we are, there's a price to be paid. You're on edge all the time. How many of you are thinking, I don't like it? I just don't like being that anxious. I don't like being on edge all the time. How many of you have had a child or a grandchild that struggled with anxiety attacks? Well, that's no fun, is it? And see, some of you in here are in that struggle right now or with someone you love. Why are we so anxious? Why are we so on edge? Well, I think in the scripture we read, we already saw it. What did verse 1 say? Don't let your heart be troubled. What's the last thing he said? Don't let your hearts be troubled. What did he say in the middle? I'm sending an advocate to help you. When I leave, things will, even, things will get better. Because the Spirit's going to come. Now, He's been with you, but He's going to be where? He's going to be in you. And He's going to be working. What do we call the Spirit? Well, you know, He's an advocate. He's a counselor. He's a comforter. So for an anxious nation, no news could be better. 
than that the gift of God is a comforter. So there's promises in this text. The first one, God and the Father can be trusted. What's the very first thing Jesus said about let not your heart be troubled? You trust God, trust me. I'm as trustable as God. Second thing he says is, Jesus is in the Father and the Father is in Jesus. Third thing he says, whoever believes in Jesus will do the works he did and even greater works than these. Fourth, he will give us the spirit of truth to live in us. Fifth, the spirit will teach us all things and remind us of everything Jesus said to us. So I want to stop and think about interior work for just a moment. When you imagine how people imagine you, what word do you think they would use for you? On edge? A prickly pear? <laughs> Calm, patient, easy to talk to, or someone that has to be carefully studied so that you don't say the wrong thing and set them off. Okay, maybe we captured a few of the things going on in here. So I wonder what it would be like if we trusted the Spirit to go to work on the interior self and we started with prayer. I want to tell you about my own, quick journey, uh, own journey quickly and uh, see if you could relate to this. So some years ago, I had the opportunity to uh, continue my education. And the very first class I took was a class that was a survey of global Christianity, uh, all the continents over the last 2000 years. So that was a, a lot of material to cover. And one of the things that I stumbled across in this reading was that not every group of believers emphasized the same thing. Now, they were working from the same biblical text, but they didn't always emphasize the same thing. You hear what I'm saying? So it's not that they always believed things differently. It's where did they rank certain things and how much would you practice them, right? So I started noticing that people who were followers of Christ from the earliest centuries that grew up in the Eastern tradition, which is what we call the Orthodox Church, right? Their fundamental core doctrine is that all of what it means to be Christian is prayer. Everything. That was new to me. Not that we wouldn't pray. But how many of you have ever heard the teaching that we're supposed to pray without ceasing? Why would we do that? Well, oh, dear God, please be with Aunt Jenny's bunions, you know, and I, I hope little, I hope little Johnny, I hope when his team wins the championship that no one gets hurt. I mean, Lord, not that you would care about one team more than another, you know. What are we praying for? Well, here's what I want you to clarify. They would say, well, the reason you pray is to position yourself before God. So that you are always before God. What does 2 Corinthians chapter 3 say? 2 Corinthians 3 says that when you turn to the Lord, the veil is lifted. English teachers. So turn is active. It's what we do. But lifted is what? Passive. So someone else does it. You turn toward God. God lifts a veil. Continue in the same text in verse 18. And we all with unveiled faces behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. So what is behold? It's active. Then what does he say? We all with unveiled faces behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord and we are being transformed. Transformed is what? Passive. So what do we do? We're wandering around or out, out here in life. We're watching our favorite newscast and getting anxious, right? And we're on our feed and we're getting anxious. And we're reading Twitter and we're getting anxious. And we go to work and it's anxious. And we watch the stock ticker and it's anxious. And the Lord says, if you would turn toward me, I have something waiting for you. I will lift a veil. 
And if the veil is lifted, what does that mean in biblical language? Well, if the veil is gone, we have complete access with God. Nothing between you and me. And so now, with unveiled face, you behold the glory of the Lord. And I will transform you. So if I was in prayer without ceasing, where will I always be turning? Toward the Lord, where the veil is lifted and I'm transformed, right? So one of the disciplines of the prayer life in the Eastern Church is uh, the, what, the prayer of Jesus, right? And some of you remember this, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. How many of you are somewhat familiar with that prayer? I know there's more than one version, but that's the one we're going to work with. And the versions are not largely different, a word here or there. So I'm going to do it again. Ready? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Let's do it again. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now let me walk you through this. Because as a disciple is being trained up in prayer, then the person that's kind of leading this discipleship process will assign them to say that prayer 3,000 times in one day. And then after a short while, it's 6,000 in one day. And then after a short while, it's 12,000 in one day. So I reached out to the only monk that I know in the Church of Christ. Randy Harris. <laughs> and I knew I was going to stay with Randy for a couple of days at his house in Abilene. So I posed this to him. And Randy said, in some disciplines, it's 50,000 times in a day. And he said, and at least once a year, I practice this. Now let's think through this. What did he promise if I would turn? Veil would be lifted. What did he say if you look at him with unveiled face? He'll transform you, right? That's what the Lord said, right? And the Lord is trustable because what did he say? You trust God, you trust me, we can be trusted. Agreed? So uh, a friend of mine that's in this doctoral program I'm in, who's in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, David, I call David. And I say, David, how do you do this? And he said, you got a little while? I said, I got all the time in the world. He said, well, I'll walk you through it on the phone. And I said, well, thank you. And I'm going to walk you through what he shared with me. Okay? So now what are we doing? We're praying for what purpose? To position ourselves before the Lord. Right? And does the Bible say to pray without ceasing? It does say that, right? Okay, so we're all, we, we know these things, right? But how many of you have ever wondered, well, how in the world do you do it? Okay, so let's work on this together. Now, here's how we'll do it. We will say that prayer uh, three times because in the Eastern Church, everything is rooted in the Trinity. You remember this? Uh, those of you that are familiar with the Eastern Church, you know they immerse, but how many times? Three, in the name of the Father, Son and Spirit. Okay? So we're going to pray the whole prayer three times. Now, I want you to listen to me. What we'll do next, so that we don't have to interrupt the process, is we're going to drop off the last word, one word at a time. And then we'll contemplate the meaning of that. You understand where I'm coming from? So Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Lord, you get where I'm coming from. So we'll leave off one word at a time. And if we don't do it perfectly, the Spirit will. 
we'll be okay. So, okay? Are you ready to do this together? Isn't it good to know that he said, if you'll just turn, I'll do the rest. We have so little to do and so much to gain by just a simple turn toward the Father. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And now we'll begin to breathe in the meaning of the transformative meaning of each word as we leave off one at a time. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me a... a what? Isn't it interesting that the first thing that drops when I'm in his presence is my overwhelming identity as a sinner. He lets that go and calls on us to let it go. To trust that in all things we've been made new. That God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Just breathe that in. Lord, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. If you believe I need it, what is it in me that I'm not seeing when I think that others need it more than I do? What went on in your heart throughout all eternity that you meant for mercy to come my way through your Son? through your spirit. Lord, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on, on whom? Have mercy on the sick one that I love. Have mercy on my wayward child or grandchild. Have mercy on that person at our church that feels so out of place after the loss of his wife, after the loss of her husband. Have mercy on the lonely. Have mercy on the jobless. Have mercy on the marginalized. Have mercy on those that have been downtrodden. Have mercy on those who live in communities that seem that there is no hope any time soon. Have mercy on our enemies that we are to love. Lord, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have, have, have. You're the source You're the resource. It all comes from you. It starts with you. It ends with you. It's powered by you. It's lit by you. Sound comes from you. Touch, taste comes from you. Sight comes from you. Love comes from you. The pain of grief that reminds us of the depth of love 
comes from you. All things come from you because you have Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. We confess our belief unapologetically. Even in our doubts, we're drawn back to this fundamental faith that there's got to be someone, someone eternal, someone accountable, someone who should be, would be, could be ruling this universe with sovereign love and sovereign purpose and sovereign power so that in our moments where life has no meaning, we cling to the trust that there is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight who tinted skies with heavenly hue and framed the worlds with your great might. You are our God and you are alive and in you we live and we survive. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Son who is like no other Son. The Son that had to have angels step in to explain what was coming. The Son that had to be augmented by dreams so that a daddy could trust the work of God in his future wife's tummy. The God who called brown men from the east. The man who called white collar, blue collar, no collar to gather around him as an infant. The God who called a widow and a young family and an old family that had just been blessed with a son. The son who came. And wise men spoke to unwise kings and said, he's from somewhere else. <coughs> Lord, Jesus Christ, son, son, the one we call brother, the one who says to us, you're all in the will. But I've been away. Come home. I'm no older brother that doesn't want you. I'm the older brother that's been with the father on the edge of my seat waiting for you to turn so the veil would be lifted and you'd be clothed in a robe, sandals on your feet. Can't you smell the feast we've been preparing for your return? Lord Jesus Christ. The Messiah, the anointed one, the one for whom the world all waited, the one who split time in half, the one who fulfilled everything that was ever said to Abraham, Moses, David, the prophets, the one for people whom on the, uh, the rivers of Babylon lamented to the Lord to do something. The one where Habakkuk said, again, in our time, the one who said to Zephaniah, to Zechariah, to Zerubbabel, to Haggai, it may look small, but it's never been so large and glorious. The one who ended up with the signet ring. And said to us, you are children, not born of blood or a husband's will, but born of God. Lord Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. How many Jesuses did you run into, Lord? How many times on your way to school? How many times sitting in a circle of the synagogue floor on a Saturday morning did you see other Josephs and Judases and Jacobs? How many times did you meet others with the name that would become the most famous name in the history of the world? The name worn by you, which became the name by which people 
could be saved. The name that we cry out in joy and the name we cry out when we have no other words that can be formed by our hurting lips. The name that's consoled us through loss, the name that we've praised in victory. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. And together, Lord. Hmm. The word we could not have said were it not for the Spirit. The answer to the entrance exam. The answer to every struggle we're going through right now. There's a Lord. This is our Father's world. And though the wrong seems off so strong, you are the ruler yet. Lord, not Caesar, not a prime minister, not a president, not a king, not a queen, not a sultan. Lord, never up for re-election, survived every sabotage and coup, reached into every country, every tribe, every nation, brought a family of people together, redeeming the world, redeeming creation. It all groans together, but it won't groan forever because you are Lord. And so together we pray without ceasing because we've turned to you and the veil is lifted. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, How you doing? Is your heart a little less troubled? Are you a little less anxious? I give you peace, and it's not the kind of peace that the world gives. So let not your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid.